Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial hints, tips, tricks, ideas, daily news, strategy. 25 plus years experience doing this, working with big firms tied towards money management, tied towards wealth creation, tied towards wealth management. That's the goal, the name, that's the drive of this show. Thanks for listening. Let's talk about where we're at, um, especially in Wall Street terms. Um, this is a show dedicated to getting you to retirement. Hopefully, we're able to pull that off on some levels. Um, again, it's going to take time. It's not a get-rich-quick show. Not in any way, shape, or form. Year to date, the Nasdaq's up 12%. The SP 500's up 2.4%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is down 3.8%. That's interesting. We started January so hot. And we've kind of maintained the Nasdaq's up 12. That's great. After three months, remember when we said that in the first month of the year? We're like, okay, it's going to be up 156% for the year. No. No. But it's up still 12% after three months. March isn't quite over yet, but we're getting there. Um, Apple, year to date, up 24%. Bitcoin up 70%. The 10-year treasury sits at 3.4% after having a very rough 10-day run. Rough meaning the world is looking at uh, banks and saying, okay, you don't look so healthy. You look kind of kind of pale as an economy because these banks are the blood of, of loans and businesses. So 10-year treasury was saying, hey, we're strong at 4.1% at the start of the year. Nope. 10-year treasuries dipped down to, you know, I keep saying this, invest in stocks when the 10-year treasury is under 3.5%, invest in bonds when the 10-year treasury is over 4%. Somewhere in between, it's not quite you know, written. That's not on. That's a chalkboard. It can be erased. It's not in pen. It's, it's chalk. But that's the right idea. Surging tech stocks pushed the Nasdaq to its best week since January last year. Um, or January this year. So last week was a good week for tech stocks. On the other hand, global banks shed $459 billion in market value this month alone. The tech stocks look overvalued, and the bank stocks look like a problem. Someone asked me this morning what I think about the Swiss call. And I'm like, eh. So just one week after U.S. officials raced to backstop Silicon Valley Bank, Swiss authorities sprinted to engineer a takeover of the spiraling Credit Suisse before the markets opened on Monday. Over the weekend, uh, yesterday, we were we were looking at this. I, I, I got to be honest with you. I wasn't totally focused on my son's flag football game. Swiss banking giant EBS will buy its credit, uh, credit rival or its banking rival, Credit Suisse. And again, these are like big, big banks. This isn't a small one. This is, Silicon Valley Bank is teeny, teeny, tiny compared to Credit Suisse. Not really. But historically, um, Credit Suisse, it's going to be about a $3 billion tie-up tie up of two of the country's storied banks. And aren't Swiss banks supposed to be really good banks? Like, didn't you grow up thinking like, yes, I'm going to have my money in a Swiss bank account? <laughs> Doesn't sound so sexy anymore, does it? Zoopy, zoopy, zoo. Uh, that's my sexy music that I play inside my head. Right before I slip in the shower. So Swiss banking giant UBS is going to pay rival uh, Credit Suisse $3 billion. Credit Suisse had experienced massive outflows last week, up to $10 billion per day, and was teetering on collapse. An uncontrolled implosion of Credit Suisse would have an incalculable consequence for the country and international financial system. UBS didn't exactly volunteer as tribute. Understanding the market calamity that would have occurred otherwise, Swiss regulators essentially forced UBS to go through with the purchase and offer the bank $108 billion as liquidity, as saying, thanks for preventing a global financial crisis. Wow. You get $108 billion of liquidity, you get to buy a rival bank for $3 billion. Who is this going to impact in the long term? The average person who banks. We're losing an iconic financial institution. It's been mismanaged for years. That's why I don't really care about it. It was valued at $8.5 billion on Friday. It was sold to the lowest bidder for $3 billion. Just like the United States authorities did last week, Swiss regulators moved rapidly to nip a spiraling crisis in the bud. One of the things we're going to see out of this is 
higher fees for consumers. I think FDIC insurance has to go to unlimited. And I think that has to fall on the bank's cost or your costs. Banks are screwed. Um, let me put say that in French. Banks are, their backs are against the wall. It is so easy to open a bank account. I did one on Friday. And it's so easy to close a bank account. Five clicks is all it takes usually. I And to see this as a weapon, if you're a short seller, I, I don't like where this is going. I do not like where this is going. So I think the only solution is instead of people pulling money out of the banks, just know that it's FDIC insured to a bazillion dollars. But if you have a bazillion dollars, you're going to be paying higher uh, insurance rates because it's FDIC, it's insurance. Um, when I see Peter Thiel, who is a rich guy, uh, sports a lot of Republican causes or a lot of Republican races, uh, venture capitalist kind of guy, kind of an Elon Musk, but more venture and less actual hanging around with companies after they go public. When he says he lost $50 million at Silicon Valley Bank, which again, he was made whole because our regulators said FDIC insurance fails the system at only 250 K. So, yeah, I do think we're going to have some um, improvements to the system. And I think it just probably means higher costs for you and me. Trump claims he's going to be arrested. This is going to be a wild week if that happens. His prediction was an apparent reference to the New York investigation into alleged hush money payments made to porn star Stormy Daniels. And one of the things he told his supporters was take back our nation. Protest, protest, protest. I don't know if I can calculate that kind of risk in the stock market. Just throwing it down there for you. At least four U.S. lawmakers agree with me, two from the Democrats and two from the Republicans, that FDIC insurance numbers have to be upped big time. Taylor Swift kicked off her concert tour. She is something, isn't she? She acts like she's still 16 or she sings like she's still 16, but she's 28 plus years old. She started her era's tour in Arizona. First show is any indication the hype is real. Swift performed 44 songs from her deep catalog across three hours and 15 minutes. Delighting fans. She acknowledged they went through enormous, considerable effort to be there. That's a knock at Ticketmaster. Supposedly, over 100,000 people travel, like businesses and like Taylor Swift, if she comes to your town, she brings jobs to your town and she brings tourists to your town. I have to look into the validity of those numbers because that sounds way too high. But looking at like Bruce Springsteen, you can kind of see like people, I've been to 1,400 shows. You're like, is there even 1,400 days of your life that you can go to music? Like people are that much of a junkie for music. So Taylor Swift is, we're going to be talking about this era tour for a long time. And she promoted, she kicked it off with like a new song, three re-recorded songs, like the marketing and management, if there is not a college course online about her already, there will be soon. And I'm going to be talking markets, money, investing, and much, much more. Find me online at Rob Black's show. I'm going to be sending out a newsletter later this month or early next month. I'm still tinkering with the format. You can sign up for it at robblackshow.com. Don't want to work forever? Check out the retirement planning guide on robblack.com. That's robblack.com, powered by EP Wealth. Nike is a company that I want to talk about briefly. I promise this year I'm going to do a little bit better by talking some specific companies, probably uh, business lessons, if that helps. Investment ideas. Um, My goal there is to help you get to retirement and teach you what I like and I don't like. I look at stocks very much so through an ecological ecosystem of the strongest i I try to figure out like the shoe market that's kind of my jungle and then you try to figure out who the players are in this case nike and adidas and then you can say on occasion there's things like sketchers and then you go how big is the market and then you look at like you know what are the cost of the markets celebrity endorsements from athletes right nike is a stock i own and it's a stock i plan to own for the rest of my life um, I didn't buy it to trade it. I didn't buy it for a capital gain. I didn't buy it to hit a home run. I bought it because it was around when I was a kid. I bought it because they have some sort of allure. 
um, with athletes to, <clears throat> let's put it this way. I'm 50 plus years old and I go through years of, of running. And then I take a couple of like maybe nine months on three months off, maybe two years on one year off. I give my body a break and I'll do things like walking and hiking and I'll try to find other things to entertain myself. But since I was 12 years old and I started running with my brother, David, who is the sweetest guy now. And he just gave me the biggest compliment. Um, I helped him navigate the stock market and helped him navigate estate plans and how to distribute my mom's wealth. And I was like, okay, you can do it this way. You can divvy everything up by sixes and give me one six of mom's apple. You take one six of mom's apple stock, Susie takes one six, or we go all cash. <clears throat> I'm like, it's probably going to be easier if you go all cash. But he gave me a huge compliment, <clears throat> and that meant the world to me. So back to Nike, though. It's stock that I've owned for many, many, many years. It's stock I'll continue to own. It is not a stock that I ever want outperformance from. I'm telling you this because I think you should write down five reasons to buy a stock, five reasons to sell a stock. And I want to own Nike on the day I die. <clears throat> Again, the goal is not to sell it and buy a boat. The goal is to live on income in retirement. And it'll be one of my names. Will it be my best name? Probably not. But it gives me the leeway to enjoy my family and not stress about how they're doing on a day-by-day -day basis. I have no fear that they're going to go bankrupt. Is the stock expensive? Yes. There's a company that makes shoes for athletes and people pay $150 to $200 for their shoes. Yeah, there's no secret there, right? We all know Nike. Therefore, you're going to pay through the teeth for Nike. It's not cheap now. It won't be cheap next year. I like it in the short, the mid, and the long term. Dividend yield of 1.1%, that's not enough. So the only reason I would sell it is when I get to 60, 65, 70, whenever I stop working for income, whenever I stop working and I need income from my portfolio, I'll go Nike, 1.1% is not good enough. Hopefully it will be, because I think it's a little bit of growth and a little bit of income. In the last five years, Nike's gone from $68 to $121. That's growth. It's doubled its stock price, essentially. Technically, not quite a double. Um, since I graduated high school, wow. How many years ago was that? 34 years ago? Holy mackerel, I'm old. It's gone from $0.22 cents to $122. Okay, so that's not fair. I wasn't buying stock in my high school, right? Since I graduated college, it's gone from $2.40 to $122. And I still wasn't quite buying stocks at a healthy level at that point. I wasn't accumulating wealth. But shortly thereafter, I was. So in 2000, well, I started my company in 1996. And it was a $6 stock. And I was definitely talking about it because it's a stock that you can't get. You can get in trouble. I need to be very cautious. But to me, it's a blue chip company that'll be around on the day I die. So Nike reports earnings quite soon. But let's talk a little bit more about it. They have products that cover basketball and soccer, also known as football. They have running men's and women's training shoes. Like I was telling you, my brother David took me running at age 12 and I never stopped. And I've always bought Nike shoes because they were the shoes that I got the fewest blisters in. They were the shoes. I know there was like Etonic and Adidas and like all these. Nah. The shoes never worked for me. They're too heavy, too tight, too something. And you can say, Rob, you're a sucker. You're being marketed to. Yeah, totally agree. Totally fall for the swoosh marketing. Like I'm not Michael Phelps, but when he wore that shark suit in the Olympics, I was like, I bet I'd be a good swimmer if I had a shark suit on. And I, I'm, not, I'm not like I'd be a good swimmer if I put 12,000 hours in the pool like he did. And became like a marsupial because of his, his body change. But I like Nike and um, they're going to report numbers on tomorrow after the market closes. Uh, that's the March 21st. Uh, one of the most important factors to determine Nike's performance will be its excess inventory management. That's something I watch. 
Nike Witness bloated inventory levels through the holiday season and up into the last quarter. It remains to be seen how Nike's promotional efforts to clear the shelves. China remains one of its major markets, and the retailer's past success has been hampered by the country's strict COVID-19 policy. So we're going to watch a little bit of the reopening. Competition from other major brands continue to be a challenge for Nike. Um, kids today don't like what mom and dad are wearing. 30. It's a good, solid name for a long-term patient investor. It has a very high PE when I buy it today. I would if I was going to hold it for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 years, which is now is my history of knowing the stock, right? I knew the shoes before then, but I've only known the stock for 30, 35 years. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black. Questions about Social Security? Check out the Social Security Retirement Guide at robblack.com. That's robblack.com, powered by EP Wealth. So I typically start my first segment with what happened yesterday or what's happened recently. And if I have time in that segment, I go into what's happening today. Didn't kind of miss that one, in my opinion. So let's try to get a little further in what's happening. Money's moving out of mega cap stocks after a big run recently. There's some worries about the banking industry has started to abate and bank stocks are moving higher. Kind of a flip of last week. Treasury yields are moving higher to fight. Um, basically, why are, why are rates moving higher? Basically, a flight to safety is unwinding. So last week, three things happened. People put money in tech stocks, and I'll tell you why. Because they can cut thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs. Amazon could probably cut 90 to 100,000 jobs. Biggest cost of doing business? Labor. Meta has got another announcement coming of job layoffs. Apple's tinkering and toying so they don't have to. But every one of these companies are flush with employees. And I'll tell you what, in a down market, you know it's going to work for their stock? Firing people. And a down market's like, we're sorry we have to do this, but there's a recession, so we're going to let them go. Or Silicon Valley, bank implodes. Yeah, we're sorry about that, but we're going to have to let some employees. It's the easy. Oh, Twitter skimmed and, and cut their employees to the bone, essentially, inside that company. More tech layoffs are coming. That's why there's a flight to safety there. And also, these companies have billions of dollars. So they can withstand a one, two, three year recession. There's some worries about the banking industry. This is the second big story of the day. Um, last week, it was panic. This week, it's less panic. So there's a little bit of relief going on. And then last week, when we saw one bank implode and we heard Credit Suisse was about to, we're like, okay, might be a good idea to put some money in safety. Therefore, we saw treasury yields drop. Now today, they're working a little bit higher. Nothing shocking, nothing amazing going on here today. We do have a Fed meeting this week. That's worthy of note, is it not? I think it kind of is. UBS agreed to acquire Credit Suisse for $3.2 billion in a brokered emergency rescue. Credit Suisse has been informed by FINMA, F-I-N-M-A, that Credit Suisse is additional Tier 1 capital. In the aggregate nominal amount of approximately $16 billion will be written off to zero. FDIC is going to extend the bid window for Silicon Valley Bridge Bank amid substantial interest from multiple parties. When there's a bank failure, other companies win, sometimes by having their depositors flee to them, and sometimes by buying the assets for pennies on the dollar. Warren Buffett's engaged White House about the regional bank crisis. Good. It could always be a good sound of reason. Federal Reserve announced a coordinated central bank action with Bank of Canada, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, and the European Central Bank to enhance provision of the U.S. dollar liquidity. So we're back to doing what I refer to as financial engineering with our banking regulators. I don't like it. Um, generally speaking, I don't like it. Do I think it's the right thing to do? Yes. But do I like it? No. Fed Chair Jerome Powell and Treasury Secretary Yellen reassured everyone that capital and liquidity positions in the U.S. banking system is strong by basically providing cash. No one's going to go to the bank and say, I want my $1 million and not get $1 million in $1 bills. So the big issue this week is the Fed meeting, 21, 22 of December. So tomorrow, uh, not December, what, what, what time zone am I in? 21st and 22nd of March. Whether there'll be a pause or another hike that will be interpreted positively or negative by the market, all comes down to the Wednesday meeting. 
Ooh. Press conference afterwards. Eh. The Fed has to say something like this. Okay, we still see inflation, so we're doing one more quarter point, but then we're going to pause and, and see how it plays out. So we just recently marked the one-year anniversary of the Fed starting to raise interest rates, and it takes nine months to 12 months to get in. So we haven't even seen those three uh, 75 basis point hikes kick into our economy. And it, it stinks because America is acquiring more credit card debt, 18.5% up year over year, going into a recession where people should lose their jobs if it follows typical historical recessions, even though we have a ton of job openings and super low unemployment. What a damnation game we play. This is like a weird game of poker where you like you draw two really good cards and then your next two cards in the river don't look all that great. Um, and then you're like, wait, we still have those jobs. So we haven't played our full hand yet, but if I were a betting man, I would say shallow recession minimum coming later this year. And again, tech companies can lead the way in the stock market, and it's surprising because they have such high valuations. But if they fire a lot of employees, I think the stocks have upside. Now, again, some better than others. Google and Facebook, I think, have more upside per se uh, than most due to the fact of their underperformance. Um, and they both have way too many employees, so they can cut way too many more employees uh, in job cutting. So that's how it's going to play out. Now, you can believe me or not. You can panic if you want to, but I'm not panicked. Am I concerned? Not even lightly. Am I constructive? I try to always be constructive. My son's flirting with um, a private high school. Uh, he and I have some dyslexia issues, not the type of dyslexia that you think of, different. And uh, we're playing with the idea of a small high school of like five classroom size, so you can get a little more attention. A small high school, about 15 to 20 size or the normal 25 to 30 public school. Um, so we're always flirting with things that change, and I, I'm just not that concerned. It'll be okay. He's got two loving parents. He's better off than most. He's got two loving parents who are one's good at math and one's good at love. He's better off than most. So anyhow, and anyway, I digress. Let's go back to the stock market and what we're seeing today. New York Community, it is a bank, is a winning standout today after they said they're going to acquire certain assets and assume certain liabilities of Signature Bridge Bank. Here's the kicker. When companies like Silicon, uh, Signature Bridge Bank and Silicon Valley Bank fail, they get sold at a discount. Whatever was there that was good. And yeah, I'm, I get the story on Silicon Valley Bank and how their clientele are elite people who have $100 million to sit around in a bank account. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. They're easy to dislike. Um, and that's the story out there. But there's still good banking relationships there. Anyhow, Microsoft is using OpenAI to make it easier for doctors to take notes. A company that I, I knew about investing, and I even considered it in the early 90s, was a company called Nuance Communications. They've got the Dragon Ambient Experience. And it's a basically speech to text kind of play. It's pretty cool what they can do. They can do speech to speech conversions of different countries, languages. The Microsoft speech recognition subsidiary called Nuance, who Microsoft acquired many, many years ago. Um, it's got an application for healthcare workers powered by, powered by artificial intelligence. So it can take a doctor's notes and draft a clinical note within seconds after a patient visit. Nice, yes. Worth billions and billions of dollars. Get excited about AI. Don't get too excited about AI. Be curious. Success to all relationships. Stay curious. You can find me online at robblackshow.com. You are listening to the Rob Black Show podcast. For more information on EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com. Since March is Women's History Month, I have decided to do something here on the Rob Black Show a little differently. Over the course of the month, I'm introducing all of you to the, some female financial advisors from EP Wealth who cover a wide variety of topics specific to women and money. What are the financial steps a woman should take when her spouse dies? My mom had to go through that. What are the top financial concerns uh, plaguing professional women in 2023? Many of the women I've dated, including my wife, had to go through these issues. How do you walk away from uh, with a financial win in divorce? That's a tough one. Um, yeah, I've been divorced and we both came out okay. 
Why are women investing less than men, even though they account for more than half the wealth in this country? So this month, I'm talking to Kathy Costas about divorce issues with women. Laura Canole about financial steps to take when a spouse dies. Liz McQueen talking about top financial concerns amongst professional women. And Stephanie Richmond talked about the gender pay gap on the show. Joining me today, Liz McQueen. She's a chartered retirement planning counselor. Liz, thanks for being on the show. I think this is super fun and super interesting and super relevant. Um, as a man who loves my wife and loves my mother, I think these are issues that we have to confront head on. What are some of the biggest challenges women face when it comes to their earnings? Um, hi, Rob. Thanks for having me. I think, unfortunately, the pay gap still exists. The mm -hmm. latest data from 2020 show that women still earn on average about 80 cents to every dollar a man earns. In some places like Wyoming, Utah and D.C., the gender pay gap is above $15,000. This results in women earning less over their lifetime than their male colleagues. And this lower wage is a combination of several things. It's, you know, the type of jobs that women tend to, to apply for, discrimination and caregiving duties. So talking about caregiving duties, almost twice as many women as men, about 43%, take at least one year with no earnings due to caregiving responsibility, further reducing their lifetime earnings ability. And finally, uh, women are forced to cut back without paid, paid parental leaving, caregiving leaving or work schedule flexibility. And this can be a real problem for women. Women are sole or primary breadwinners in about 41% of American households with children. And this, you know, lack of access to paid parental leave and flexible working schedule, schedules causes women to leave the workforce in greater numbers. Crazy, to crazy topic to digest. A lot going on. The pay gap still very real. It's been very real for 30 plus years of my career, and it seems it's not going away. Time off for caring for loved ones. We were all seeing this with our parents aging, but time off to work with children or to raise children. Um, my wife is a stay at home wife. Um, our mother, she uh, does a great job at it, but she's losing workplace career experience. How did these earning or income challenges, Liz, that women uh, uh, get affected with, how does it, it change their planning for retirement? Well, I, I too was a stay-at-home mom. I took a 16-year career hi hiatus before going back to the workforce, so so I uh, empathize. It, it makes it harder. This lower lifetime income that ability that women have means that on the back end, we get lower social security. You combine that with the fact that women live longer than men. On average, it's about 5.7 years. It means it can be a significant challenge for women to save enough for their golden years. Unfortunately, the poverty rate for women over 65 is just over 10%. So we really need to do a better job of planning for our later life. Um, because of this, we need to be more consistent and methodical in our savings. And actually, truly working with a financial planner can help you assess what you need to save for your later years and develop a realistic and sustain, sustainable savings goal. You know, having that long term, long plan goal can really help us just plug away at getting that lifetime income together. And so that we do have enough to support us when we get to our retirement years. Loving the content. Um, one of my favorite movies had a great quote. It was The Crow, where. The good guy saying to a woman who is not being the greatest mother, he says to her, mother is God in the eyes of a child. Um, couldn't agree more because my mother is a goddess in my mind for not only giving birth, but raising me, which couldn't have been easy. But there's something that you wrote in a blog at EP Wealth, epwealth.com forward slash blog. All of our blogs are there. They're all free to the public. It's pretty cool that we have that. You refer to it as the motherhood penalty. What does that mean to you? Um, absolutely. So the motherhood penalty, well, you know, right now in the US, we have about 11 million job openings. So we need babies, you know, we need babies to fill those job openings. But all kidding aside, having children is an enormous economic benefit to our society. However, women are financially penalized for having children. In a study by the Census Bureau, researchers found that between two years before having that first baby and a year after, the earnings gap between the opposite set part step opposite sex partner and the spouse doubles. This gap continued to grow until the child reaches, reaches age 10. Now, although it does narrow after the age of 10, it never actually goes away. During this period, we typically see mothers earning about 58 cents for every dollar a father makes. And this is referred to as the motherhood penalty. You add into this equation the unreasonably high cost of childcare. Child care. You know, my, my daughter, who's expecting a baby in June, is looking at childcare right now. And it's, you know, it's the cost of sending a kid to college. 
And this forces many women out of the workplace. You know, this high cost, particularly with low wage women whose earnings can barely offset these costs. We have a society that punishes mothers, even though we need and want women to have more children. In 2021, you forwarded me some research that showed that 48% of women were contemplating a career change. I had no clue. Um, why is that jump happening or that thought of a jump happening? I think it's a lot of things. I mean, I, I do think COVID uh, really tipped the scales for a lot of women, especially for those with children. It created such an additional burden on women who were often juggling working from home, managing online school for their kids, plus the stress of pan the pandemic. I think it made women really consider what we want in life. You know, we talk about this work-life balance, but it's never really been achievable. And I think, you know, as we continue to, to look at women's issues, women are looking at more flexibility in their working lives. We see more and more women looking for opportunities to work from home, for flexible schedules that allow them to accommodate their needs, you know, access to, to paid time off for parents, parental leave or caregiving leave. As you said, you know, a lot of women my age are juggling not only college aged kids, but we're juggling parents that need additional support as they age. So I think women are really looking for support in the workplace from not only their employees, but their colleagues to allow them not only to be successful and important members of the working community, but successful and important members of society, whether it's as parents, as caregivers, as friends. And I think we're really looking for that support in our jobs. Now, I used to be an investment advisor and I'd see women and men come into my office and the women's portfolios by and large were better put together than men's. The men were hitting a lot of tech stock home runs and strikeouts, but the women had diversified portfolios, which worked better over time. Um, it's pretty well known that women trade less often. They, they think a little bit more before they invest. What are some of the other challenges that women have when it comes to investing? I think the biggest one is confidence. You know, I think we're told or we we believe that we're not good at investing, you know, so it's something I think a lot of girls are told, oh, you know, that investment stuff, we leave that up to the men, you're not good at it, which actually is not, not true. And in many ways, it works to our advantage. A 2021 Fidelity study shows that women actually perform better by about 40 basis points in their portfolio. You take that 40 basis point increase over year on year, and that can result in tens of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Typically, women are less risk tolerance and more focused on a life goal. And so as a result, women tend to hold more assets in balance fund. About 23% of women are invested in balance fund and about 12% are invested in target dates funds. So these kind of set it and forget it funds actually are very beneficial to women because, as you mentioned, they trade less actively. Less trading means less trade costs, less trade fees, less turnover in the portfolio, fewer taxes. So these are all actually things that work in a woman's favor. So I think the, the answer is having that confidence that they can go ahead and they can be invested in the market. They can make good choices and they can stay the course for the long term. And I think really important for women, especially if you're married, is don't take a back seat. You know, it's your responsibility. Household finance is a responsibility for both of you. So, so don't abdicate that responsibility. Stay engaged. It's your money as well. And as always, working with an investment professional can really help you choose the appropriate investments for you. So we're limited on time. Do you have any quick advice to the professional women listening today? Yes. Pay yourself first. Sign up for your company 401k plan and attend those participant educational trainings. Create a monthly savings goal that you can stick to and set up automatic savings. You know, if that money doesn't come into your checking account, you're less likely to spend it. Sounds super simple. Take care of your health. Get regular checkups. It's much cheaper to stay healthy than fix it when you get sick. Develop and maintain strong social network of, of women and friends. You know, women are likely to live alone for at least several years. So having a strong support system is vital for emotional and financial stability. And finally, don't deprive yourself of things that bring you joy. You know, we read these books that say, don't buy that latte or Susie Orman with her one pair of earrings, but we only have one life to live. So save sensibly and live fully. Sounds great. For people who want to digest this, there's a podcast on the show, but they could also go to epwealth.com forward slash blog. Her name is Liz McQueen. She is a chartered retirement planning counselor. It's Women's Month, and I think she did a great job. Thanks very much, Liz. Thanks for having me, Rob. Good day. And let's quickly hit on one woman who had a very good year last year and who's going to have a very great year this year, Taylor Swift. She's 33 years old. For some reason, I think she's 28 in my head, but she always 
looks 16 to me. She's a 12 time Grammy winner. She debuted her career in 2006 with a single with Tim McGraw. She's worth $570 million of which last year she added a whopping 92 million to that, to create that figure this year. Could she hit a billion? It's it's possible. She makes music by, or she makes money by selling her music. She has touring money, get this merchandise money, fragrance money, endorsements money, film and TV. She doesn't do a lot, but what she does do, she she gets paid well for. Um, she's been in David Russell's Amsterdam. She's been in CSI crime scene investigation. She makes money on fashion and real estate and much, much more worthy of note. For more information about EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com.